Women are speaking. Women speak in the Quran. Oh, wow. That means we need to have, you know, Ilhan Omar and Rashid al marching. And wow, you're a, you're a civil servant. Oh, my God. You're a civil servant. So impressive. You're being made to feel small by Noman Ali Khan. You're being made to feel small by feminists. They're the ones who are saying, oh, you're wasting your potential. Where? What show I, us. Show us the tradition, Noman Ali Khan. What, what are we missing here that you uh, that you know and everyone else somehow missed? Please, you know. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sunan alhamdulillah, salat salam rasulillah. We're just going to talk about a very important topic of how American Islam, quote unquote, has been spreading its liberalism, its feminism to the Muslim world in a very aggressive way. And we want to look at a particular video where you have a very popular figure, you know, celebrity, who is preaching this kind of feminist message to a very conservative society, Pakistan. And this is just one example of a much broader trend that has been going on for quite some time. We usually think that Muslims would be taking their deen and their understanding of religion from scholars who are established, they have trained in the Muslim world itself, they have lived and taught in the Muslim world itself about like core matters of the deen. Why would someone in Egypt look to, you know, an imam uh, in the US to learn about hijab, you know, or to learn about how to pray, how to fast? When you have some of the best imams, some of the best scholars. And if you have access to the language, you know, that's who you study with. You stay with people in Egypt, or that's who you take from, or other parts of the Arab world. Same thing with Pakistan, or India, or Bangladesh, or Turkey, Malaysia. Why would you go and look at the US? Part of the reason is that there may be among some Muslims a kind of inferiority complex to think that, oh, well, we can learn our religion from these, you know, enlightened Westerners <laughs> learn about praying and fasting and wearing hijab and uh, halal and haram. That's part of it. But the other part of it is that there is a huge effort to take this watered down Islam that has been peddled in the West, in America, in the UK, etc., in Europe, take that and export it and spread it to the Muslim world forcefully, you know, basically really put a lot of money behind it, put a lot of visibility behind it, and present these watered-down figures who are preaching a watered-down message, present them as these, you know, pinnacles of Islamic scholarship and knowledge and so forth. That's that's the strategy. Uh, this is explicit. The U.S. <laughs> State Department has the strategy. It's spelled out in the RAND report, Building Moderate Muslim Networks, as one of the RAND reports that talks about this in detail. And we see this, you know, we see many of these very popular figures traveling to places like Pakistan, to Malaysia, to Turkey, Nigeria, parts of Africa and East Asia. And they, <laughs> you know, say things that most Muslims there don't agree with, first of all. The majority don't want this. And second of all, the only a lot of them don't even understand English. <laughs> a lot of the Muslims in these countries aren't English speakers. It's only the economic elite who can understand like what these guys are saying. And then they are empowered to spread that, this economic elite within those countries. So they learn these things, they get a justification like, okay, well, if the Fulan Imam Sheikh said it in, in the US, you know, they're doing something right, they must be doing something right, we need to implement that and, and take our country away from these backwards mulvis or these backwards mullahs that don't know, you know, they grew up, they grew up in the villages. That's the mindset of some of these economic elite, educated elite who still care about Islam, they care about religion. Um, I, I assume most of them, some of them might be pure hypocrites, but most of them do care about Islam, but they're just fixated on this kind of Western message, this modernized Islamic message. So this is 
this is the dynamic. This is how you can slowly step by step change a society. And that's uh, what is being done to the Muslim world. So it's, you know, very upsetting to see like these figures who have destroyed, you know, I well, maybe destroyed is too harsh of a word, but they have really messed up the Muslim community in their country, in, in the U.S., and now the same garbage that has caused so much damage in the thinking and the iman of a you know generations of muslims here in the us now they're like aggressively pushing it overseas in these and it is countries that are really they're religious and they haven't been impacted by secularism in the same way that other countries have. So like Egypt has been really impacted by secularism. Uh, Tunisia has been really impacted by secularism, for example. But you see like a revival of Muslim conservatism, Muslim like traditionalism in countries like Pakistan, in countries like Malaysia, in countries like Turkey. Have you noticed that these figures go specifically to these types of countries? I don't think it's a it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence. Or Nigeria, there's a revival of traditional Islam in these countries after a few decades of more secularist dominance. And then, you know, this revival, like you have people who are trying to revive Dean in these countries, and they're turning to the likes of, you know, these compassionate Imams in the West. So it's like it's being subverted. The impulse to traditionalism, the impulse to rejecting modernity is being hijacked by modernists, by reformists. Talk the talk of tradition. They talk the talk of, oh, Islamic revival. But they're just spreading the same garbage, the same liberal, feminist, modernist garbage. Like the, the, like celebrity imam is kind of a pejorative. It's kind of like an insult. Like, oh, you're just a celebrity imam. But they, in their material, they are actively like, they're actively um, invoking that concept. You have like screaming women. Oh, please, please, please. <laughs> like. The, so if you, if people call you like, oh, you're just a celebrity imam, like you're just in a pejorative way, like why should they deny it? Like that's the kind of thing that they're uh, encouraging themselves, like in their own videos. <laughs> So coming back from Nust, um, lots of students wrote written questions and I got a few of them later, so I'm going to read one to you. This is written by a, a young lady. What is the right role of women in leadership positions in community? For me, I have been a very vocal and outgoing personality, passionate to make an impact. In my various roles, I have had tons of people-centric engagement. I someday want to be a civil servant too. But all along, I have been told that leadership isn't for women. How do I contribute if I'm made to feel small? Here, there's an organization for Islamic teaching, some name she mentions. They keep their women behind the scenes. They have no social media presence, as if they have nothing good to give. Similarly, women are told to be hidden off and away, as said by, and she mentions some speakers. What do I do with my influence? I never want to use it for my own fame, etc. I avoid it, but I am brought to position somehow by God's will. How best can I use my ability, especially in the digital age? And when I'm fully hijabi and fully according to Islamic attire. So this is actually a kind of a, a renegotiation and a rethinking of some of the assumptions we have about 
the role of women in the Ummah. And one of the best places we can try to understand this is in our history. So there's two ways to answer this. First, obviously, being a student of Qur'an, when somebody brings up an issue, I think about the Qur'an and I think about how would somebody who's navigated and scanned the entire Book of Allah, how would they respond to this? The second place you'd go is like the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam, and say, how were women in the Prophet's life? What roles were they playing? How were they participating? The third place you'd go is, we have a very vast history in Islam, right? We, we're not just one continent or one culture or one nation, one language. We spend every continent and we have a rich history in every continent. How are Muslims that were committed to their religion, men and women playing their roles in all these different places throughout history? And if you scan all three and you, with, with, with exceptions here and there, with, in the Quran, for example, there is no place where women are not being given or being put in a certain kind of cage. In the family, Allah did make men the head of the household. That is a leadership responsibility Allah gave men, which is why they're called Qawwam, caretakers. And so they are responsible, and that's why they have to be financially responsible. So there's a leadership role there. But then there are other places in which women are taking leadership roles. Like at a, at a very micro level, when Musa's mother lost Musa salam in the water, um, she also had Harun. Harun is the brother, but she sent the sister to go, because Harun's the older brother, so he already exists. But she sends the sister to go, and she takes the lead and goes and all the way follows Musa salam to the castle, and then, you know, even recommends that they bring the mother back. So the entire story rests on the intelligence of this little girl. Who so is this a leadership position? Uh, you know, to follow, to do a task that your mother has given you. It's a very Im important task. There's all kinds of other reasoning that we could imagine for why a little girl is better to be sent to keep an eye on Musa in, in the basket as he's going down the river and going to a castle like it's more suspicious if a older person if older male person is going and watching and you know that's more conspicuous um, but a little girl doing that it's less conspicuous it's less like oh there is someone spying on on Firaun is someone spying on the castle as someone plotting something what's up with this basket and so and anyway how is this a leadership position we recite about in surah al-qasas there are small examples glimpses like this in the quran where women are outspoken where women express themselves like the angels came to talk to ibrahim alayhi salam right and they said she's going to he's he's going to have a child but his wife was in shock so she started screaming and almost yelling at the angels and now the angels who came to speak to Ibrahim are now speaking to the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? And it's remarkable that Quran recorded that, that, that the, the, the carriers of wahi are now actually having a direct conversation with this old woman, you know, and they're consoling her. There are times... So that's, I mean, screaming at angels, like I don't think that's the correct uh, reading of the ayat on this, but then... Again, how is this leadership? So if anywhere in the Quran, a woman speaks or a woman does something, that's leadership. So this is like the kind of, but it's the, the problem is that if you're not like thinking about it, you're not paying attention, you might fall into this mindset that, oh, yeah, that. Women are, they're doing so many things in the Quran. <laughs> women, women are doing so many things in the Quran. Why can't we be doing so many things as civil servants and as leaders and becoming the prime minister and becoming members of parliament? And why not? We Women are doing things in the Quran. <laughs> women are speaking. Women speak in the Quran. Oh, wow. That means we need to have, you know, Ilhan Omar and Rashid Al-Tulay marching and Linda Sarsour like, you know, leading these, leading these marches. <laughs> like it, it's silly, it's stupid, but <laughs> look at like the person saying it, who he's saying it to, what he's reacting to. This is shocking. And, and the reasoning, like 
and and people, you know, hopefully as students at Alesna, this is something that you are going you have already gotten or you will continue to get studying our courses is that we have to be critical in understanding when someone brings evidence. They claim this is evidence for my position. This is evidence for a feminist position. This is evidence for a liberal position. This is an evidence for whatever, for reforming Islam or having a new ijtihad. Here is the evidence. You have to take a step back and think, okay, just because he's citing Quran, just because he's citing Hadith, just because he's citing aqwal of the ulama, statements from the scholars of the past, that doesn't mean that's evidence. What is the connection? How does the cited, the purported evidence, how does it actually support the conclusion or the message that he's giving? So you have to think carefully and listen carefully so that you're not deceived, you're not fooled. Because this is this is basically a trick. He's This is a trick that he's pulling. Because even if he, you know, if he were here right now, we're talking to him, that this is the first thing that we should say. How is this relevant to leadership? Why are you calling this leadership? Or uh, Sarah, for example, the wife of Ibrahim, in this incident that you're citing, you know, quote unquote, screaming at the angel, she was also like just assuming that's the correct uh, reading of the ayah. It's in her home. <laughs> She's in her home. She's not outside, you know, screaming at angels. So that seems to be actually a counterexample. He wouldn't be able to respond. He wouldn't have anything to say. He would just have to change the subject, right? But there's no scrutiny because this is just like a soapbox. This is just a platform for him to spread uh, this nonsense. And a lot of Muslims will see right through it and recognize it as trash. And, but unfortunately, a lot of other Muslims and Muslim women will say, oh, see? This great scholar, <laughs> this great scholar it was, it was just, you know, a speaker. No one, Ali Khan, like, I'm not, like, taking away from the good that he's done because unlike a lot of compassionate imams, I think No Man Ali Khan has, you know, contributed a lot to Muslims being connected to the Quran, caring about the Arabic language, wanting to study the Arabic language. He's, like, he has created his own system for teaching Arabic. And that is like something constructive. That is a positive thing that we can see from Noman Ali Khan's dawah. But unfortunately, he has this kind of feminist nonsense or sometimes he will make statements that are very wrong and are appeasing liberal sensibilities. So unlike other compassionate imams that I criticize, I think Noman Ali Khan actually does have that positive component, whereas others are just glorified storytellers. They they don't have the same kind of positive contribution that Noman Ali Khan does. But, you know, that doesn't mean he's beyond criticism. That doesn't mean he's beyond uh, critique. So uh, it's like taking the hadith of Umm Waraqa leading prayer and then stretching it to show how in certain spheres women can lead and then developing a blueprint of leadership from it. Exactly. You had like some of these feminists do exactly that, taking you know, examples of uh, Sahabiyat from the Sira or the Salaf, taking examples and then using that to prove some kind of feminist leadership message. Ali ibn Abi Talib said a word of truth by which they intend falsehood. They can twist any Quran story and parable to fit their narratives. Yes, exactly. Twisting the truth. He says in the Quran, there is no place where a woman is put in some sort of cage. LOL. <laughs> He's inserting these revolting words that makes one agrees with him before laying his argument. Yeah, great point. See, he like he um, off the bat is straw manning the opposing side um, because the letter that he read, you know, assuming that's actually a letter from a student, it, it probably is, but you can't. Um, you can imagine like this is something that someone gave him like, oh, read this. And he doesn't know where it's from. But yeah, the, he mentions certain speakers say, certain institutes say like women shouldn't be out. Women shouldn't be in these kinds of leadership roles. And then he he editorializes it and says, oh, put women in cages. So he's already biasing the whole discussion. of Wahi are now actually having a direct conversation with this old woman you know and they're consoling her 
there are times where women have to step up and play a role. What are the principles? The principle in Islam, Allah did not say women should, you know, uh, remain hidden. In fact, even the ayah wa qarna fi buyuti kunna in Surah Al-Ahzab is talking about Ummahatul Mu'minin, it's talking about the mothers of the believers. And that's there's a reason for that because they are considered our mothers forever. There's a reason they were given special instructions. In that same surah, Allah says, لَسْتُنَّ كَأَحَدٍ مِّنَ النِّسَاءِ You're not like any other women. That's why they had, to, and no other woman will always be considered the entire ummah's mother. They cannot marry any other man after them. If they just walk around outside, even if they're fully covered, and some man says, I wonder if she's married, he's having a thought about his mother. Allah wants to prevent that completely from even happening, ever. So He tells them, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِ كُنَّا so even when the Sahaba come to meet with Aisha radiallahu anha min wara'i hijab, she, she has to meet them from behind a curtain. She can't, she's not seeing anybody. So they were given special instructions. But the instructions for the rest of the Ummah, they're in Surah An-Nur. And this is complete nonsense. And this is straight from the reformist playbook. Like all reformists have this, you know, nonsense interpretation of Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33. Let's read the ayah that he's referring to. And abide in your houses and do not display yourselves as was the display of the former times of ignorance and establish prayer and give zakat and obey Allah and his messenger. So look at the commands already in this, the beginning of this ayah. Abide in your houses, stay in your houses, do not display yourselves like in the times of ignorance, jahiliyyah. Establish the prayer, give zakat, obey Allah and His Messenger. So five separate separate commands. And then Allah intends only to remove from you the impurity of sin, O people of the household. Ahlul Bayt, meaning the household of the Prophet. And to purify you with extensive purification. So the reformists will say that, oh, see, all of these things are only for the Ahlul Bayt, only for the household of the Prophet <laughs> But these are five very general commands. How can they only be applicable to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ and no one else? Clearly the uh, not displaying yourself. So he actually said that <laughs> there's nothing in the Quran that says women should be hidden. Well, here it is, the same verse that you're citing. Do not display yourselves. So that's number one, that no one, there's no scholar who says, oh, do not do not display yourselves is only for Ummahat al-Mu'minin, only for the mothers of the believers. Everyone else can just <laughs> go wild, display yourself. No one says that. This is the verse that's cited. This is the ayah that's cited. Anything related to hijab, this is the ayah that's cited. There's no taqsis here for only Ummahat al-Mu'minin. And then establishing prayer and zakat, obviously that's applying to everyone and obeying Allah and His Messenger, apl applicable to everyone. So why only that first part is directed to, there's taqsis for, there's like, it's specifying Ummahat al-Mu'minin or Ahlul Bayt. This is, you don't find that in any tafsir. All of these apply. And that's why in every school of thought, there's no difference, not even school of thought. You can look at other, you know, manahij, madahib, uh, different schools of aqidah, different sects, even the Shia, even the, you know, Ismailis at that time. Every school, every school of thought historically, even those who are not even considered Muslim, they have the same interpretation. They have the same understanding that women need permission from their awliya from their wali from their guardians in order to go outside of the house to leave the house that is islam and this is the verse that establishes it this is the ayah that establishes it again there's no difference of opinion on that there is just difference of opinion on you know for example a husband prevents his wife from seeing her family by you know keep by not giving her permission to leave the house what what kind of recourse does she have then some say yes she can she can leave some say she should try to inform others to you know contact her family so their family comes visit or her family like basically <laughs> sues the guy and and gets the right to see their daughter like because she has a right as a wife to see her family and the husband ha doesn't have a right to prevent her from that so in islam 
but he does have a right to prevent her from, you know, going, you know, visiting someone. She ha he does have the right to prevent her from going certain places. He does have the right to say, no, you know, you can't travel to such and such place. He does have the right to say that. So this is like standard fiqh. This is standard fiqh. And the fact that most Muslims in the West, I don't want to say most, but many Muslims in the West don't understand like this basic, like this is a ba one of the basic uh, rights of a husband. This is one of the basic rights that a husband and a guardian has in Islam. And it's very clear cut in the Quran, but they don't teach it. Like if your Islam is based on what Noman Ali Khan says in his lectures or what some of these uh, celebrities say in their lectures, you're not really learning Islam. You're getting like Islamic flavored information, like Islamic flavored storytelling, entertainment. You're not actually learning the basics of your deen. And that's why, unfortunately, so many in the Muslim community are just uneducated and they're ignorant. And then if someone like you or me goes and say, no, no, in Islam, like the, the wife has to have permission from her wali, from her guardian, from her husband in order to do certain things. That's like a basic part of Islam, basic, one of the basic duties in marriage. They'll say, you're an extremist. You're an extremist. You're a, you're a red pill. <laughs> You're a red pill, a misogynist, you don't understand Islam, and they'll attack you as being like literally a terrorist. And you're just like conveying like the basics of deen. But, you know, there's another point here. Let's just assume that Noman Ali Khan is correct here. And Noman Ali Khan really has this tafsir correct. He's saying that Qarna fi buyuti kun, Surah Al Ahzab, verse 33. This is only applying to Ummahat al Mu'minin, the mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet. It only is applicable to them. So let's just concede all of that for the sake of argument. Okay, this is another thing that you should, as uh, students of Alasna, this is a strategy that you can employ. Think that, okay, even if, even if we concede, okay, everything that Noman Ali Khan said, okay, no problem. We'll steel man his argument. We'll steel man it as opposed to straw man it. He straw mans the op opposition. We're going to steel man his argument. We're going to say, yeah, okay, your this ayah only applies to Ummahat al It doesn't refer to any other Muslim, Muslim women woman today. Okay, fine. But how but if if we accept that, that contradicts your own logic. How? Because the Ummahat al Mu'minin were the best <laughs> they were the most knowledgeable they were the most noble they had the highest characteristics of piety the highest characteristics of um you know character and modesty and intelligence and so if there's anyone who should be a leader amongst women it should be them if there's anyone who should be Front and center, if we, you know, according to Noman Ali Khan and these compassion imams, women should be front and center because, you know, that's what Islam wants. Islam wants women to be leaders, just like men, equivalent to men in society. If that is truly the uh, Islamic value or the Islamic principle, then why is it that the most knowledgeable, the most noble, the, mo the highest in character, the best examples... Allah is saying, don't leave the house. Don't be out there leading. Don't be out there in you know public view. Don't go and be a civil servant. Don't go there and, you know, <laughs> this contra this verse, even if we take his messed up interpretation of it, it still is a contradiction to his overall point. Because if this were a value to promote women in society as leaders, then the most worthy of leadership in that way are the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, so, yeah, so, like, he characterizes it as um, putting women in a, in a cage. So, that's not the case. So the feminists have to insist, no, she can go wherever she wants, whenever she wants, and how dare you think that you can have a say in that? What kind of marriage would that be? <laughs> like, what kind of marriage would that be? So someone asked recently, actually, um, so does the husband also need permission from his wife to go out? No. The husband doesn't need permission because 
there is no order from Allah to stay in your homes for men. Men have to go work. Men have to go and take care of all kinds of duties. They have that degree of authority over women. So they don't have to have permission from their wives to go out. So that's, that's not, there's no equality there. And if you have this in your mind that there has to be perfect equality between men and women, between husband and wife, so much of Islam is going to be uh, seen as wrong to you. It's going to be seen as completely problematic and misogynistic and abusive and oppressive if you have this equality standard. But we don't have this equality standard in Islam. And that's why Muslim marriages are better they're better they're more natural they're more stable they're more long-lasting they have more love they involve more love how are you going to feel as a husband if your wife is doesn't view you as her protector if your wife doesn't view you as her guardian as her caretaker as her leader how how do you feel as a man a normal man is going to be hurt by that or is going to feel like is going to feel bad about that. A normal man is going to feel like, oh, even my own wife, I'm supposed to be her knight in shining armor. I'm supposed to be her protector, her hero. And but she doesn't even care. <laughs> she just goes out, does whatever she wants, you know. And if you say anything, uh, honey, maybe not go. Shut up. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me where to go. I'll do whatever I want. How is he going to feel? He's not going to, there's not going to be that level of love. He's going to be, he's basically being abused. That's the thing. Feminism puts women in this cognitive di dissonance where her nature is saying, that's what I want. I want to be taken care of. I want to be, you know, protected. I want a guardian who is going to be strong. And that's what she wants. But feminism is telling her, no, you don't want that. You want the opposite of that. So they want to be feminist, they want to be strong and independent, they want to be, you know, the modern woman, but their nature is telling them something else. What they, their nature is telling them the exact opposite. So then they end up being very dissatisfied, depressed, confused, and they don't know why. And they don't know why. And then those feelings of confusion and dissatisfaction, they project that onto the husband and they say, oh, the husband is abusing me. This is the paradox, actually. This is the paradox of the more and more women are given their rights, you know, their rights, quote unquote, according to feminism, the more and more a man caters to his wife, caters to, you know, everything that she wants, makes her the boss. You're the boss, honey. I, you know, whatever you want, whatever you want, just tell me. I'm not going to say anything. The more that she he does that, the more she despises him. The more she actually hates it. That's how she feels. Co consciously, she doesn't know why. She just feels like, I hate this guy. <laughs> she just feels it and she doesn't know the reason. On paper, in her mind, oh, my husband is the perfect simp. <laughs> my husband is the perfect feminist ally. He's a feminist ally. He's really helping me and... He, he's, you know, he treats me like a queen. So on, according to the feminist formula, that's, he's great. But internally, she hates him. Unconsciously or subconsciously, she despises him. But she doesn't know why. So then the brain makes up a reason. Oh, it's because he's abusing me. He's, he's not emotionally satisfying me. So that's why the definition of abuse keeps getting larger and larger in scope under feminism. And it's becoming like more arcane. <laughs> like what exactly is, a, is abuse? Like it's just how you feel, but you know, he's, he's subconsciously <laughs> abusing me. He's telepathically abusing me. <laughs> so it's becoming more and more subtle because of this cognitive dissonance. So the, the, the special status of the women, the, the, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu by and large, that's discussed in Suratul Ahzab. So what we've done is we've kind of conflated these things and made them into using that to generalize women are supposed to stay inside. But they didn't <laughs> stay inside. There's enough evidence that women even joined the Sahaba in battle. Oh my There's God. There's enough evidence that they were interacting with the men. There's enough evidence they were traveling together. They were, I mean, the, the, the Hajj ritual itself, itself breaks. This is the most sacred ritual. 
Shouldn't there be a women's section for Tawhaf? Why was there never one? Because they were a part of society. And... Shraman, no one said that. Qarna fi buyutikun. Stay in your homes mean women are not part of society. No one said that. So Shraman. Like Hajj. So all of these scholars, 100% of them prior to modernity, who said this ha said that this is the position in Islam. This is this is the ha this is the ruling in Islam. This is the hukm in Islam regarding women. All of them were idiots. <laughs> like they're so stupid. They didn't understand that. Hello, there's Hajj. <laughs> we have Hajj. Women go out for Hajj. Don't you know that? Don't you realize that? You idiot, Mullah. <laughs> How can you say that women should have permission to go outside their homes? Don't you realize that there's hajj? Oh. The thing is that Allah gave us this deen based on fitrah. There's some natural things we're supposed to be uh, inclined towards, like decency, the way, the way a person dresses. Allah gave khimar to the women, not because it protects them from the uh, they're protected from the eyes of men, but actually they're protected from their own desire to show off, actually. If you study Surah An-Nur, that's what it's talking about. So once they observe these principles of haya, of modesty, of engagement, like the sisters of, uh, or the, the two sisters in Madian who were getting the water from the well, they're engaged in a hostile non-Muslim environment and they're working, right? So women being in a public space, women fulfilling a certain role that normally is associated with men the Quran never condemned it the Quran never spoke against it and how somehow we think this is a modern idea it's not a modern idea it's a classical idea and if you actually study Islamic history you'll see throughout our tradition that this was a non-issue <laughs> and even in contemporary what is he talking about <laughs> wait what do you mean that's a non-issue it is a it's a huge issue that's why he's asking about it because even up to this day, Pakistan and, and many Muslim countries, they've preserved this. Like women should not be in the public sphere in this in that kind of way where they're just doing the kinds of jobs that men are doing. That's that's the norm. So how did that arise? He's saying that what? That just was a deviation that came out. But when you look at the Sirah, you look at the Salaf, you look at the Sahabiyat, they aren't practicing what he's talking about. Just because there were some Sahabiyat that were involved in battle, in war, what is the actual context of that? The actual context of that is that these were battles where the Muslims were about to be wiped out, existential threat to the existence of the Ummah, the future of Islam. So even the, even the traditional conservative Muslims, the Orthodox Muslims, they say that, yeah, if you're in a situation where the invading army of the enemy is about to destroy the uh, city or is about to completely uh, envelop the community, then it's all hands on deck. Men, women, children, everyone needs to be involved. Otherwise, we're going to be dead. In those cases, yeah, of course, women have to be involved. And in the Sirah, those were the situations where women were involved in battle itself. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, no. Women are not permitted to go to battle. That's that's crazy. Women are not permitted in Islam to go fight in battle unless it is a life and death situation with an invading defensive force. The fact that they're talking about women going to battle, okay, as if this is a permission granted, it's like the only the only situation where that would be relevant is for offensive warfare <laughs> if muslims are actually doing jihad at talab like they're going and expanding and conquering where do you see women involved in that bring me examples of women who are in the battles when the muslims were going and expanding you don't see any <laughs> examples because it's not it's not permissible like this is not the, what women should be doing it's a it's a problem it's a problem or there there are ex you'll have examples of like um Ola bint al-Azwar, who her, this was in the time of uh, when Omar radiallahu anhu was uh, Khalifa. And she went to battle because her husband or her brother was kidnapped by the Nasara, by the Christian forces, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Azwar. And she, so they use this as an example as well. But she like, she did that. 
and the scholars recognize that this is like an exceptional situation. Her her family has been kidnapped. She wanted to personally be involved, and she didn't like go and say, "I'm a woman and I'm going to fight." She had to actually mask herself and dress like a man in order to do that. So that's something that is not like a normal situation. If it had been permissible, this is actually proof against the feminists. Because if it had been permissible for a woman to just go and join the battle, then why did she wear a mask and cover herself and make her look like make herself look like a man if it were permissible? The way that it's portrayed by feminists is actually wrong. It's like the proof against them. Yeah, and and the way that that's understood is that she this is something that is incorrect but she was under emotional distress. She was under such emotional distress that she did this action, but it's not permissible. But she can be excused from that, but that doesn't mean this is a model that, oh, women can now, it's permissible for women to go and join Babel. So all these examples from Naman Khan, feminists bring them up, reformists bring them up constantly, and they've been refuted like a million times. Contemporary life, I like, I like examples like Malaysia and Indonesia. I like these examples because these are very vibrant, very committed, very educated Muslim societies where women play a great role in the society while holding on to their Islam and their Islamic principles. It's a beautiful thing to see. And there's no reason for someone to think that's not supposed to be the case or you're not supposed to be in, oh, women are meant to be, oh, doctors and teachers and nothing else. No, you can be a civil servant. Why not? What's wrong with you being a civil? What's wrong with you, be, with, with you being a lawyer? What's wrong with you being a professor? What's wrong with you being a research scientist? <laughs> oh, first of all, is civil servant like some really high, great position in Pakistan? Because in the U.S., like you can be a civil servant means like you work at the post office. Like, that. like there are all kinds of civil servant jobs. They're not like, wow, you're a, you're a civil servant. Oh my God, you're civil servant. So impressive. <laughs> You, you like you you can deliver mail and be a, that's a civil servant it's like you're working for the government so <laughs> civil uh, is he conflating civil servant with leadership i don't know but then he's saying like yeah you can you don't have to just be a doctor or a civil servant you can also be a lawyer you can also be a professor you can be this you can be that okay well why can't she be a plumber why can't she be an electrician? Why can't she be a construction worker? Why can't she go and, you know, do oil drilling or mining? Why, if there's equality, you know, between the sexes, let's get these women, <laughs> let's get these women tilling the fields, plowing the fields. <laughs> Aren't women equal to men? They should be doing those kinds of jobs too. Why are the men only doing those kinds of jobs? The hard labor. The, the dangerous jobs where men's life expectancy is like a few years less than a woman's life expectancy because he's doing all these kinds of this kind of hard labor. Why isn't why aren't we pushing women into those fields, into those jobs, if there's so much equality? No, it's only it's only the desk job. It's only the lawyer sitting in a nice, comfortable office or the professor or all these high status jobs. So is, that seems to be a contradiction with the feminist message as well. There's nothing preventing you from any of it. And this is the same advice I would give my own daughters. Pursue whatever it is that you, Allah has given you. And if we don't do this, we're taking more than 50% of our talent pool and we're basically telling them all your education, all your mind, all your potential is useless. It has, there's nothing you can do with it. You know, wow, that's and then the, the next art basically saying that, you know, if you want to be a wife, a good wife and a mother and raise the next generation, you're wasting your potential. You're throwing it away. You, all of that intelligence that you have, you're going to waste it by being a mother. You're going to waste that by being a good wife. <laughs> so this is pure modernist feminist garbage, like just poisoning minds. This is the this is exactly what you hear. The most rabid, you know, frothing at the mouth feminist on social media. This is the kind of garbage she's she's typing. Oh, you just want to be a mother? Like this is constantly what Um Khalid is getting online on, on her posts, like uh, promoting motherhood, promoting um, white Islamic being a wife according to Islam proper 
properly, correctly. Constantly, these feminists are whining like, oh, you're wasting your potential. Oh, you're such a, this is such a waste. This is such a waste of your talent and your education and blah, blah, blah. This is like such a colonized mindset. The reason that every generation in the West is getting worse and worse and worse is because the talent, the intelligence of women is not going to educate or raise the next generation. Instead, it's being, it's going to uh, these major corporations making a profit, increasing their profit, increasing their quarterly earnings. That's where the talent has been sucked out from the home. The talent has been sucked out. The intelligence has been sucked out of the home and it's being used by corporations to enrich themselves because women are going to college, they're getting degrees and they're going straight into the workforce. Partly because they have to, they have to pay back all the loans that the thousands of dollars, the hundreds of thousands of dollars they have spent to get that education is through riboy loans, is through interest bearing loans. So they have to go work to pay that back. They have no choice, you know, the, in this free society. Who's benefiting from that? All of these corporations, they're getting the talent. They're getting all that potential that could have been used to raise a strong generation of believers of Muslim believers who are going to worship Allah, who are going to stand strong to defend deen and to establish the word of Allah. These generations in the U.S., even basic morality, like kids these days, they don't have an understanding of basic morality. Like they're, where, where do they learn morality from? From their parents? No, from their smartphone that they get at a young age, going through whatever, YouTube on their smartphones. That's where they're, that's the tarbiya. That's the education that the children are getting. Their parents aren't home. Their mom is working. Their dad is working. And then they go to school. That teacher, like some of these teachers are really khabith. They're really disgusting, filthy people that are teaching your children in these public schools or even Islamic schools. In Islamic schools also, like unfortunately, they're, they're very low standards for who they hire in many of these schools. So that's who, that's... Those are the people bringing up the next generation while all the talent and education is making, you know, an extra million for, I don't know, Microsoft or for whatever company that you're, you're working for as a smart and educated woman. Wow. Microsoft really, the investors really thank you. These fortune 500 uh, companies, they, they really, they really appreciate all you're doing. All that talent is really making their making their pockets nice and full. This is So this is what they want for Pakistan. This is what they want for Malaysia. Argument people give as well, if they, if they do these things, how will they be good mothers? The same way you're doing all these things and you're still supposed to be a good father. That's, that's, that's a non-argument. There are plenty of people that used to work, women used to work in the farms and get water from wells and all, all this other stuff while they were still mothers. Okay, they great. were doing... Go, <laughs> women today, yeah, nine to five, go. Actually, farming is more than nine to five, okay? Go in the field, start start tilling the fields right before Fajr. Pray Fajr, then continue tilling the fields until Maghrib, yeah? Empower yourself, go work in the fields as a farmer. And this is like, this is a revisionist history from Noman Ali Khan. Trade, husband died, they, they, they have to do trade, they have to make a living, you think every <laughs> they have situation to do trade. is normal? Your husband dies, so then you have to go and do trade. You have to like travel to Syria. <laughs> you have to go as a woman. You have to go and join the other traders, the other men, and like, you know, go down the Silk Road so you can trade to China and India because your husband died. So you have no choice. <laughs> this is nonsense. What are you talking about? If your husband dies, guess what? You marry someone else. You marry someone else. Uh, you can even be a second wife. You <laughs> Like, there's no problem with that. You're not going to go and tr start trading. <laughs> you become a trader. Like, what, what are you talking about? Every situation is standard. There are plenty of single women, divorced women, that had to take care of their children and had to make ends meet and worked hard and raised their kids. So this idea no. that somehow they are left. There wasn't. It was, it was, there was no infrastructure for that. The reason that th that's possible today to have a single mom raising kids is because of welfare. She's getting a check. She's getting a welfare check. 
She can put her kids in public school. Uh, this is actually what Um Khalid talked about yesterday in, in wife school. There's a whole infrastructure that will allow women to uh, be single and raise kids. They're, they're not raising kids. <laughs> they're not raising the kids. It's the state that's raising the kid. She's working for a company. You know, she's working for, let's say, McDonald's. <laughs> she's on McDonald's workforce, making money for McDonald's, making money, money for those investors. Her kids are in school. She's not raising them. She's not raising them. And I'm not, again, I'm not like attacking single moms here because unfortunately, this is the world that we live in, the world that liberalism has created for us. But it's a dystopia. We have to recognize that it's a dystopia. I'm not attacking like these single moms. They have no choice in many cases. In many cases, not all cases. But this situation cannot exist without that infrastructure, without that welfare system, without that public school system. Guess who pays for that? Men. Men are paying for that with their taxes because taxes, men pay a disproportionate amount of taxes or they contribute a disproportionate amount to the um, to the taxes that are collected by governments. This is because men work more, they uh, work longer, they ha work higher, you know, higher paying jobs, etc. So they pay more to the tax system and women take more from taxes. Women take more from these social welfare programs than men. Men are expected to work. So that's uh, that's why you can have these single moms. This did not exist prior to prior to the modern welfare state. Because if you don't have, how can you work and raise kids if there's no public school system? There's no like, you know, and, and the kind of jobs, there are no desk jobs. <laughs> you have to go, like I said, be a trader or you have to go till the fields. <laughs> how, can a, how can a woman do that? And also take care of her children? It's impossible. So this, is, this has never existed. Lesser mothers, or they're too busy with their career, therefore they can't be mothers. I think that idea is silly. And the people <laughs> who make that, that, that idea don't even know what it means to be a father, really. Because they don't understand what kind of partnership it takes to raise a child. They just think, oh, that's a mother's responsibility. No, the personality of a child is as dependent on the mother as it is on the nourishment of a father. You, you need both. So, yeah, yeah, you need both, but to what degree? <laughs> like, what degree? How much is the uh, father necessary versus the mother's influence on children? Both are necessary, but does it have to be equal? Or is equal participation or equal involvement necessary? That's impossible. Especially like there are many men today and in the past, they have to work 16 hours a day, like literally two jobs they have to work in order to keep their family housed, keep their family fed, clothed. They have to work 16 hours minimum per day in order to provide for their families. And that's the situation for many. I don't want to say like a, a majority, but a sizable percentage of the population. That's like what the men have to do. Not even factoring in that women also, their wives might also have to work. And then they have to rely on a public school system or a daycare system in order to take care of their children. But the whole system is designed to get people into the workforce. Why? Because that benefits the these corporations. It benefits the wealthy. It benefits the upper classes to have as many people in the workforce as possible. So it's a waste for that corporation for you to be at home with your children. But men have no choice. Men, ha This is like he's making it sound like, oh, men have the luxury to be outside the home, <laughs> slaving away, tilling the fields, you know, trading. This is like a luxury, like men are have it so good. And and women, these guys are having a vacation while, you know, instead of raising their kids, these deadbeats, these deadbeat dads making money so they can have a roof over their children's head and food in their mouths, these deadbeats working as if like, you think a father doesn't want to be at home with his kids, like having fun, enjoying his children. That's what the that's what the men want, but they don't have a choice. A lot of times the arguments that are presented to make such a case 
are very problematic. This young lady even says, I'm made to feel small, right? And that's exactly the feeling. Why am I being made to feel that? Because of my gender, I can't contribute. I have nothing to offer. You're being made to feel small by Noman Ali Khan. You're being made to feel small by feminists. <laughs> They're the ones who are saying, oh, you're wasting your potential if you don't be a civil servant delivering mail or pushing paper behind a desk. You're, you're nothing unless you do that. You're nothing if unless you can go and stand in front of men and teach them or lecture at them and be a professor or be a sheikha. You're wasting your potential. That's what's making you feel small. Or the role in which I can offer something is very limited. No, so long as you're following the principles of this deen, then the area in which you can serve, the scope in which you can serve is completely an open playing field. It's That's completely false. open to you. And I would encourage you to pursue it. And I would encourage you to even study your deen deeper and look at the arguments and look at the counter arguments and don't just listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. Look at the evidences yourself, study the history yourself, and you'll be amazed and empowered at how many women, on the backs of how many women, just like men, this deen has been carried. It didn't reach us just because of the contributions of men. It reached us because of the contributions of men and women. So no, I agree. I have a few thoughts on this issue. I agree. It reached us through the contributions of women uh, to a very great extent as much as men. Why? Because these women have been raising great generation after generation. That's the contribution of women. They've raised the greatest Muslims. They have raised Salah al-Din. They have raised all of the great figures of Islam. Were raised by great women, great Muslim moms. And many of them had great Muslim wives who supported them in their efforts, in their juhud. That is a huge contribution that no one denies, and no one should deny, and no one should belittle. They weren't contributing by, you know, sitting behind a desk and pushing paper or like going and doing what men were doing. That is not how they contributed. Because if that's your standard, if that's your standard, then women have not contributed the same as men. Try to understand my point here. If the standard is women contributed in the same way as men contributed, that is false historically. Look at the, all of the top scholars or the major, vast majority of scholars in any field, in any Islamic science, fiqh, hadith, tafsir, so forth, any Islamic science, 99% are men. 99% of them are men. Women were very few and far between. And the women were, in almost every case, the daughter or the wife of a, a, a scholar. So they were basically acting in proxy of their scholarly husband or scholarly father. Whereas, you know, this 99% men. So you, he is setting up this impossible standard and it's a myth. Women were not contri contributing. This is a historical fact. They were not contributing to like the major scholarly developments, the major scholarly preservation, the major debates. They were not contributing. They were not participants in that. So the contribution was by preserving the ummah, by raising these scholars, by raising them, by making them want to become scholars, by being righteous. Like, even if I look at my own family uh, in Iran, like my grandmother, she had eight children, including my dad. My grandfather had 20 children because my grandfather had multiple wives. But my grandmother, biological grandmother, had eight children. And my grandmother was very religious. She was very religious. And her contribution is greater than some of these other children, in my estimation. Some of these other children, they, yeah, they have high positions as doctors, high positions uh, in government even, high positions in all kinds of areas. A lot of them, or most of them have like lost Islam, or they've lost any kind of sense of Islam. So her contribution, I mean, it wasn't her fault that they turned out that way. She tried her best, but you know, her contribution is more significant to society, to the ummah, than being a doctor or a lawyer. But that's completely what Noman Ali Khan says about that is that's wasted potential. Instead of having eight kids, because you can't have eight kids and also be a working woman 
or going and doing like degrees and reaching your potential. You can't have eight children. It's impossible. And you can't raise them. I pray that our daughters really feel the sense of empowerment they've always felt throughout our history and somehow they've lost that. You know, last, last comment about this. They say, oh, you're, you're, you're abandoning traditional values. People who say you're abandoning traditional values, I would counter argue, maybe you should study the tradition a little better yourself before you, talk, before you represent traditional values. Because if you actually studied our history, this is not what you would be saying. So those are just some thoughts. Allahu ta'ala alam. Where? But show I, us. Show us the tradition, Nawani Khan. What, what are we missing here that you, uh, that you know and everyone else somehow missed? Please, you know, it's all these cherry picked examples. Like he didn't, he didn't even do the cherry picking like others do. I'm sure in other lectures he does this because I know that he has all kinds of problematic stuff in some of these lectures um, that are along these feminist lines. But yeah, show us the tradition. I want to know what we've missed. That was Noman Ali Khan spreading feminist garbage to Pakistan. Um Khalid texted me this quote about the military success of Khalid, Khalid ibn al-Walid, uh, the greatest general ever, the greatest military commander of all history, not just Muslim history, but of all history, radiallahu anhu. Uh, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, uh, the Khalifa said, quote, women will be unable to bear the likes of Khalid ibn al-Walid. Women will be unable to bear, like give birth to, so this is showing like, this is honoring the mother of Khalid. She raised such a uh, great man in every respect. And look at how much the Ummah has benefited from the likes of Khalid. But everyone should be aware that um, his mother gets so much credit. His mother gets so much credit. So you see Abu Bakr appreciating mothers, appreciating women, but in the correct way.